Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Kling, Chief Operations Officer at NCH Healthcare System. And over the past three to four weeks, we've done a lot of rounding and a lot of listening to you all. And we've had a lot of very good feedback, concerns, um, questions that uh, we thought would be very appropriately answered by a panel of our physician experts. In a second, Dr. Harrington is going to introduce our physician panel. But, uh, and uh, I will be moderating the questions and our physicians will be answering them. Um, we have gotten probably 100, close to 100 emails and questions or more over the last three or four weeks. And we've kind of collated a lot of them or repeat questions that we thought would be very helpful. And what we said from the beginning of this, when we made the decision uh, for the vaccine is, uh, please educate yourself. You know, we have a great new website, naplesinunity.com. It has great information great research, uh, our daily statistics uh, as an ability to um, help educate yourselves. Most importantly, get the vaccine. If you don't, if you are still concerned, get with your primary care physician or your a trusted physician, talk to them, and then use the naplesinunity.com as a resource as well. So um, this is going to be uh, us answering all the questions that we've had over the last three to four weeks. There will not be a question and answer session at the end because this is our question and answer session and us listening to your questions and answering them. So at this time, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Harrington to introduce our panel and we'll get going. I'm gonna take off my mask. Um, I wanna thank John and administration. I'm Doug Harrington. I'm one of the critical care physicians. Um, and I literally just finished a nine day stretch at the North Naples Intensive Care Unit. Uh, Dr. Lidner is also on the phone and most of you know Dr. David Lidner very well. He's our section chairman of pulmonary critical care. He's our COVID leader and he's now on service that took over from me. So he's now doing a seven day stretch in the COVID ICU at North. And also on the line is uh, Gregory Poland and we're very honored to have him here today. And I just want to explain exactly who he is because he's going to help us answer a lot of these very important questions. He is a uh, vaccine specialist. He's probably one of the lead, world's leading experts in vaccines, including uh, being a professor, full professor at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where he is now sitting in his office. He's also the editor-in-chief of Vaccine Magazine or Journal. Uh, considered the premier journal in the medical field on vaccine research and vaccine efficacy. So we're truly, and he's on staff here at NCH. He's one of our physicians that we go to off. Uh-oh. Okay. We well, just lost like him. We just, it looks like we lost them. I don't know if um, people can still hear. And it looks like they're going to be reconnecting. Uh, there they are. You're, you're on mute, though, I think, Doug. There we go. Got it. So thank you very much. We're going to have John start with the first question. Okay. So, all right. So first question we got, and we had multiple of the same question again. So remember that if we don't hear your, your exact wording, we kind of got all our questions together. For those who have had symptomatic COVID in the past have the benefit of natural immunity, which has been shown in many studies to be robust, durable, and complete. The risk of reinfection of COVID once one has been previously infected and recovered is around 0.25%. These people all are also protected well against the Delta variant, which cannot be said about any of the vaccines. Why not permit those with previous infections who can show positive antibodies be shown as, a, as being protected just as much as the vaccinated? We'll kind of let you tap yeah. on. Well, we, I think I'll start on that and introduce, and Greg will take um, pick up on that. Um, we actually don't, um, and I would have to disagree with part of the question, we don't really truly understand um, um, the degree of natural immunity. Um, when people keep referring to multiple studies, um, first off, I think you need to put the time period of those studies into context. Many of those studies that people are referring to are, um, go up to and include the time period before the present Delta variant, as well as um, the variants to follow, such as Gamma or Lambda. And if you were speaking of uh, natural immunity to Alpha, 
um, you know, in what we used to call the UK variant, then you may have a much better and more robust, um, you know, answer to that question. And even the often quoted Cleveland Clinic study, which is the one most people refer to, even the author of that study has stated that at this point in time, that um, study is only good up until discussing alpha and does not discuss and um, look at um, Delta or the other variants. We know that basically, and we have shown in both basic science and others that the vaccine basically provides much more robust immunity than natural um, immunity. And I think Greg can comment on that much more um, distinctly. Yeah, um, uh, let me start off by saying uh, and endorsing what you just said, David. Uh, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. The way in which to approach your decision making must be science-based. If you reject science as a way of knowing, then you have no epistemological leg to stand on in order to make reasoned decisions. So behind that question are in fact layers of misinformation or misperception. There is, whether you're talking about convalescent immunity or vaccine immunity, there is no such thing as, I think as the, the questioner put it, complete protection or complete immunity. That does not exist. That can never exist uh, in a situation like this where you have an RNA virus that's continuing to change. Um, just to uh, talk about even the alpha variant, one could simply look at the Kentucky study. You can go to the MMWR and look it up for yourself. Uh, if you look at those who were previously infected and then divide them into two groups, those that went on to get vaccine as recommended and those that did not get vaccine, the difference in reinfection was 2.3-fold different. So in fact, quote, natural immunity did not provide complete protection. And as Dr. Lindner is saying, we expect that that difference will be even greater in the face of Delta. Any other comments, Doug? Okay, thank you to our physicians for that. Next question. New studies are showing that the COVID vaccines may lose their durability after about six months, making some of those who are fully vaccinated at risk for spreading disease, as we have seen frequently with the Delta variants. Are those who received their shots greater than six months ago going to be required to show proof of antibodies via blood test, or is NCH just assuming that these people would be protected? If not, why? Dr. Paulin? Yeah, again, a number of misperceptions rolled up in that question. Let me start with something as simple as antibody level. There are a lifetime of complexities in this. Which antibody? Neutralizing antibody? Binding? Non-binding antibody? Uh, above and beyond which we do not have a correlate of protection. I cannot tell you at what antibody level are you protected? At what level are you not protected? It also completely ignores the role of innate immunity and cellular immunity. So, so it's way too simplistic to point to, quote, antibody um, uh, uh, alone. Um, the, the, John, the first part of the question again was, was what? So it says um, there was, new, studies, new studies are showing that COVID vaccines may lose their Oh, yes. Okay. Months. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, that, that fits with this idea of antibody level. We expect, because it is true for every vaccine we give, that there is a biphasic antibody response. In other words, you give your series of vaccines, you have high antibody level. They always, they always for every vaccine decrement over time. That does not necessarily mean increased uh, susceptibility to disease. It could, depending on the vaccine and, and, and the virus. So the real question is real world effectiveness studies. Do we see 
outcomes of interest over time after people are immunized. Many people point to the Israeli data. Those data are discrepant from the US, Canadian, Scottish, and English data. Um, nobody's particularly sure why. So you really have to say, okay, after each month, after getting vaccinated, are we seeing enough breakthrough infection that is severe or leads to hospitalization? You will always have breakthrough infection with every vaccine. I've written an endless number of papers about this. This is no surprise at all. The question is, is the breakthrough infection one that leads to death, severe disease, hospitalization? And yes, we care about transmission too. So what are those rates of, of transmission? Um, sort of contaminating all of this has been the press release today saying that the Biden administration is looking at booster doses at eight months uh, after uh, uh, completion of the primary series of, of vaccines. Many of us think that's a bit premature. We don't yet have data that, in my mind, that would justify a major public health initiative like re-immunizing 300 million people at this point. We may get there, but those data have not been published yet. Okay. Greg, can you comment further um, we also know that um, people who are vaccinated, that basically there may be an entirely different presentation to the body of the virus. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. For that, that's a good point. When you, when you see the virus, when you're infected with the virus, you're making antibody to all of the structural and non-structural displayed proteins. In other words, you're making a pretty narrow but broad antibody response. When you get the vaccine, you're making antibody just against spike protein, but very deep antibody levels. So when you hear about antibody levels dropping, which they do with every vaccine, for the most part, that may even be irrelevant. These vaccines are generating antibody levels that are so high that even tenfold reductions in antibody uh, is still protecting people. Now, that may not be true when you start off with low antibody levels like immunocompromised or frail elderly, but for otherwise healthy people, the majority of uh, whom probably our listeners are, uh, a, a reduction in antibody level is probably irrelevant. And I think a corollary to this and um, is worthwhile and bridges off the former question. People who had initial COVID, for the most part, unless they were critically ill, um, developed their response only because of a respiratory presentation of the virus. Yeah. People who get the vaccine are getting basically uh, with an intramuscular injection, they're getting a much more robust antibody production because your body perceives the instructions to make the antibodies from a different source basically um, from the parenteral source as opposed to only the respiratory source. And that is a difference in the immunity conferred by vaccine versus natural um, um, disease. You know, we can even put numbers on that. If you look at the Chicago Rush study, um, people who were naive, their baseline antibody level was four, basically zero. After one dose, it was 1,800, two doses, 15,000. Now take somebody previously infected, their baseline antibody was around 600. After the first dose, they got to 30,000. After two doses, 36,000. And it tells you exactly what you were talking about, that reinforcement of immunity in people previously infected who have uh, low antibody levels generally over time and get vaccinated and have really superb boosting uh, of their protective antibody level. 
And then uh, I'll add what the question was, does NCH, uh, will they be requiring showing a proof of antibodies via blood tests? We have no plans to ask for antibody levels for blood tests at NCH. Okay, uh, the next question, um, I'm going to read it, but we're going to put some information out. It's a very technical question on our website, but I'll read it just so we can be very transparent with what you all will see. Uh, those who do not take the shots are required to get tested weekly. What if there are false positives? Is NCH safely relying on the RT-PCR test without clinical correlation? Uh, it is so why? What is the cycle threshold that NCH is using for the RT PCR test to determine a positive test? Those are all very science evidence based answers that are very objective. So we're going to put those out on our website. We'll put them on our uh, Tuesday team talk as well. Um, and uh, that, I don't want to take up too much time talking about the the the, the microcosms of this vaccine and the testing of it. So um, next question for our panel. Why is NCH testing people who are asymptomatic? This goes against any science as those who are not presenting with any symptoms have less than a 1% chance of spreading COVID. And I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and start off that response. Um, this infection has a asymptomatic window. So you can walk around spreading, shedding the virus for two to four days before any symptoms. So the person that wrote the question, less than a 1% chance, again, as Dr. Pullen alluded to, uh, that's based on inaccurate misinformation. The CDC has actually modeled, they believe, up to 59% of all infections that are being spread now are being spread by asymptomatic individuals. So it's much more than 1%. An asymptomatic person can absolutely spread this infection for two to four days before they develop symptoms. So I, these questions are all very, very important and we're gonna answer every single one of them. But I'll tell you from spending nine days at the North Naples ICU and David Lindner is there now, I've been doing critical care for 30 years. I have never seen this level of illness, this level of suffering, and this level of stress on our system ever. And I would encourage all of you. I would encourage all of you to please talk to your coworkers. If you see Dr. Lindner and I out walking, ask us direct questions. We have to do. We're all in medicine for a reason. We're all in medicine to help, to assist in the care of other people. This is a challenge to us now that we have to do the right thing and we have to be vaccinated to continue to take care of the patients that we were charged to take care of. And you know, uh, Doug, I would just add to that. Uh, I'm up here at Mayo. Uh, this, this is true for uh, all uh, healthcare systems. You're seeing it across the US, you're seeing it across the world. Colleges and universities are requiring it. Private employers and other business sectors are, employ are, are doing it because you have to follow the science when the world is on fire uh, like this. And you cannot overcome all of the misconceptions that people have. And you finally have to just say, you know, whether you believe it or not, we have speed limit laws for a reason. We have traffic control signs for a reason because the science bears out on this particular road, you cannot go faster than this speed limit. And the same is true with vaccine policy. David, if you want to add to that before we go on to the next question. Okay. You know, I thought of, about this and um, very, very um, strongly and I have opined on this with our country commissioners uh, with the, on the school board with um, you know numerous other institutions consulted with several universities when it really comes down to it as healthcare providers and dr Harrington was re, um, was re alluding to this um, with that we do many things basically where um, the key is to basically keep our patients safe to keep one another safe um, and, and do this. The real issue here is that we have, you know, and truly we have an obligation to others, you know, greater than ourselves. And often, very often um, we do this, especially as um, parents, 
um, you know, we basically put ourselves, you know, into the position where we have to do something for the betterment of others. We have a very a sick obligation at, uh, under our mission um, to care for our patients, to protect them. And because of an asymptomatic spread phase, um, this goes all the way back to the beginning of this pandemic where, where people did not understand that this is an aerosolization virus, that this is how people spread it. And people who can have the potential to spread it to others, basically we have to identify them and to basically render the chance for them spreading it um, to not be existent. That's our goal. That's why we're doing this. Thank you, all of you on that one. Uh, next question. And I want to uh, remind our, our expert physician panelists that uh, we're not uh, attorneys or legal. We're, we're going to answer this question in the science. Uh, can you please advise me of the approved legal status of any vaccine and if it is experimental? Yeah, this, this word experimental <laughs> gets used as, uh, you know, kind of a emotional code word, I, I would say. Um, we expect that the uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine will receive full licensure that it's called a BLA um, in this in the month, no later than the month of September with Moderna to follow and J&J &J to follow after that. These are all being used not as experimental vaccines, but under an EUA, an emergency use authorization, which is a carefully controlled way of doing this. What's interesting to me is I'll walk into one room and a family will rail at me as to why hasn't the FDA approved this vaccine for children under the age of 12 yet? I'll walk into the next room and the, the family will rail at me as why is FDA rushing this? Both can't be true, but it, it reveals the emotional uh, basis upon which they're thinking and using terminology. So that, let me just say that this, these mRNA vaccines in particular are the most studied and scrutinized vaccines that we have ever used before. This is a vaccine that will be used at some point in every human being. That's a tremendous amount of scrutiny. That's a tremendous amount of study. The phase three clinical trials were among the largest vaccine studies ever done. Any of you listening, if you have ever taken a prescription medicine, I will guarantee you it has not been studied at the level this has been. The phase three trials were not as big as these. If you've taken any other vaccine with the exception of rotavirus, you took a vaccine where the clinical trials were not as big as these clinical trials. This has been tremendous scrutiny. And it's one of the reasons that it takes so long for um, full uh, licensure. To give you a visual graphic, if you think of the largest freight elevator made, the paperwork involved in a, a full licensure of a vaccine would not fit into that elevator. And every single sheet of paper, every electronic piece of data, has to be viewed by somebody at FDA and verified. It's literally that level of scrutiny. Anything else from Dr. Harrington or Dr. Linder? Thank you, Dr. Paul, for that. Um, getting close to the end of our questions, but um, next question. Can you provide details and assurances that the vaccine has been fully, independently, and rigorously tested against uh, control groups and the subsequent outcomes of those tests. Dr. Pohn, you talked a little bit about that. But yeah, you know, that, yeah, that's a, yeah, that is a great question and a fair question. It, it relates to what I just talked about. Those are, those are the data that we get in phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. So each manufacturer is required by law to undergo those phase three trials. And as I say, they varied from a bit more than 30,000 subjects to a bit more than 40,000 subjects. And those subjects have to be followed over time, which is why it takes so long. When people, on the other hand, people will say, well, it's rushed. Well, rushed in the sense that 
um, they got the world to cooperate and enroll these 40,000 subjects very rapidly. That can often take a year or two alone um, and then cut as much of the uh, administrative red tape out of that as possible while not compromising safety. So, you know, uh, uh, I'll just talk about Mayo Clinic here. Uh, nearly 100% at this point of our physicians have all been vaccinated. Well, there's nobody in the healthcare system that knows the data better than the physicians administering and taking the vaccines for themselves and their families. So you would have to presuppose that you know something that all the scientists and all the physicians don't know, and that we've all made a big mistake by getting ourselves immunized. But quite the contrary, the data, and we are data-driven as much as possible in medicine, clearly points to not only the efficacy, but the safety. Is any vaccine 100% efficacious? No. Is any vaccine 100% safe? No, but neither is any man-made product that you use in your lifetime. Most of you are gonna get in a car later today. You may not realize it, but you run about a 15% lifetime risk of permanent disability through that, through that behavioral act. And yet you do it because in your mind, the benefit exceeds the risk. And that's what we must always do if we're wise people, is to look at the risk, look at the benefit, balance those, and make intelligent decisions. I wanted to specifically comment, um, and I think um, it has helped me to understand, if you look back to when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a different modality than the messenger RNA vaccines, um, was initially rolled out, and uh, with that, to understand the scrutiny and how the vaccine committee looks at this. So what happened? There were 8 million initial Johnson & Johnson vaccines um, um, administered. And, there were, uh, and they found that in women of childbearing potential on birth control pills, if I remember my numbers correctly, there were about eight women who basically had the initial, that thrombosis, which so many people have asked me about. And what happened? Immediately, the FDA put a hold, they didn't halt it, they put a hold on further vaccines. They looked at it to see whether or not this was out of proportion to the natural history of those thrombosis and whether or not, because we all know that birth control pills lead to that, and essentially, you know, that put a whole lot of people up in arms, but that shows to what degree, even after emergency use authorization is granted, that scrutiny continues. What happened is that it was determined that there may be a small, very small increased risk of the thrombosis, which is openly acknowledged, but yet basically that hold was released. And those types of things are, have been ongoing with everything from the reactogenic nature of the vaccines to basically the, you know, you've heard about some of the myocarditis. There, are, Yes, there are things that the vaccines can produce, but at this point in time, those are studied, those are looked at, they have been cautiously evaluated and scrutinized, as Dr. Poland said, to a greater degree than medications that many of us get over the counter and take without even a thought. Let me, uh, let me, put, let me put some numbers on uh, what Dr. Linder is saying. So let's take that blood clot. I'm just looking at the data here. So if we take a million women, 50 to 64 years of age, three to four of them may develop that blood clot problem. So that's the consequence of taking the vaccine. What if you decided not to take the vaccine? Well, out of a million, uh, 12,000, now this was before Delta, so it would be higher than that, 12,000 would get infected, 1,600 would end up in the hospital, 350 would be in the ICU, and 120 would die. So which risk do you want? 
You only get two choices, get vaccinated or eventually get infected. Yeah, I would uh, echo what Dr. Lindner and Dr. Pullen said, is that obviously everyone's concerned about a vaccine and the side effects, but to give you an idea, when we talk about the blood clots, we talk about myocarditis, we talk about a disease called Guillain-Barre that is a weakness ascending through the body. These occur with almost every single vaccine that's out there. The incidents with this COVID vaccine are less than anything we've seen before. And to give you an idea, the percentage of a side effect is a point, so a point, five zeros in a one. So it's like one, one tenth of a percent. So the vaccines are extremely safe. As Dr. Poland very eloquently said, the risk of getting COVID, the risk of having a complication from COVID far outweighs the minuscule risks of this vaccine. Um, I had a nurse in the ICU who had a patient who was not yet on the ventilator and he was saying to the nurse, um, I didn't get the vaccine. And the nurse said, well, why didn't you get the vaccine? He says, because I don't know what's in it. And she said, well, sir, I just came in your room and I hung four different IV bags. You never once asked me what was in those IV bags. So you have to trust the healthcare institution. This vaccine is safe. We have to protect our employees. We have to protect each other. We have a few more questions and then I wanna to try to spend a couple seconds. There's been a, some very good questions running through the chat. So John's gonna run through the rest of the questions and I think many of these we have answered mm -hmm. and then I'll go through the chats that you were nicely asking. So I think, I think we've answered, the, our physician uh, panel has answered one of the questions, which was we, what are all the adverse reactions associated with the vaccine since the introduction? We just talked about two or three of them here. Yeah, and, and you can go you can go online and look at the FDA website and you'll see a list and the frequency of them. That's all available to anybody. So we'll provide that on our information as well. The, uh, one of the, a lot of the questions, can you provide a full list of contents of the vaccine I am to receive and if any are toxic to my body? Yeah, obviously the FDA does not allow us to administer things that are toxic unless there's um, uh, some compelling reason. For example, you might say that some chemotherapy agents are, are toxic, but again, that's a benefit risk decision. The list of ingredients and the, the chemical composition of that is on the FDA website available to anybody. And then can you confirm that the vaccine, we've already answered this, but I'm going to ask it again so we go through these questions. Can you confirm that the vaccine you are advocating is not experimental mRNA gene altering therapy? Yeah, so again, there, there's a, a, an example of the you know, idea. And you know, for, for people that don't study this, how, how would they know? So I'm sympathetic to the question. Um, but, but they're using a phrase that they've heard repeated by disinformation and misinformation. The mRNA vaccines are not capable of altering your DNA. They cannot get into the nucleus. Therefore, they cannot somehow magically integrate into your chromosomes. It's just not possible. In a bizarre way, we wish mRNA could because it would be a fantastic therapeutic option for uh, treating people who had genetic and other diseases, but it just doesn't work that way. Okay. Thank you. I and the final I, question. John, I, I think that this gets asked so many times, and I think that there is a, a, a good way that um, people have I've heard and used. Imagine that I send you a message. I, tell, uh, I send you a message to do something. You send a message out on our email to all the staff telling them to do something. Our email server then basically takes those messages and after a certain period of time, discards those messages. That's essentially what we're doing. We're giving, the vaccine gives you a message and the message tells you to do what? To make antibodies particularly to the spike protein. And then what happens is your body, the email server basically then discards the message. That's no. it. It That's is good. very simplistic. 
That's a good analogy, Dr. Linder. Thank you. Uh, final question. Uh, what is the risk of fatality with this vaccine? So, so the vaccine itself does not have a risk of fatality. When you are, unless you developed anaphylaxis that wasn't treated, I, I suppose you could count that. But when you hear things like uh, a bunch of people in a nursing home in Scandinavia got the vaccine and, and died, what you have to realize is let's go back two years ago before there was any COVID, any COVID vaccine, anything else, and pick any one day in a nursing home, people died. And the same is true with side effects to vaccines. For example, for pregnant women, the most common outcome, in fact, it occurs in about 20 to 25% of pregnant women, is that they will have a spontaneous miscarriage. So what do you think happens if you get the vaccine and you're pregnant and a day later you have spontaneous miscarriage or a week later, or a month later? What do you think they blame it on? They blame it on the vaccine. So the only thing you can do is go and look at background rates. And for those that are interested, I published a paper about a month ago on this in relation to COVID vaccine. So you look at background rates, people who didn't get the vaccine or before the vaccine, and you compare it to whatever outcome you're interested in after the vaccine to see if those rates are different. If they are, then it's a red flag for a potential safety issue, much like David was describing with um, uh, TTS. And then you go and investigate that further to see, is that risk real? Is there a pathophysiologic mechanism for it? And do we have, are there people at particular susceptibility for it? So we do not see death as a side effect of the vaccine other than if somebody were to have something like an anaphylactic reaction. Okay, I scrolled to the top. Of the Thank you. So we're gonna spend the next five minutes or so and Dr. Harrington's gonna go over a few of the chats. I know we said that we weren't gonna do this, but I think our physicians are driving this. We are a clinically driven organization and our goal is to give you the information you need to make an informed decision. So Doug. So I've been watching the chats come across and there is a small number, but some very important ones. One of the first chat was asked is, the unvaccinated NCH are being blamed. Um, and that this person that said this chat was that we had lower numbers in the hospital before many were vaccinated. Now our numbers are going up and more people are vaccinated. The reason this is occurring is that the Delta variant is what is now driving the surge we're seeing. And I'm sure you've looked at the emails, but. 85% of all the people in the hospital right now with severe COVID are unvaccinated. 95% of all people in the ICUs are unvaccinated. So the reason our numbers are going up, it's not because we're vaccinating more people in the hospitals because the Delta variant is running through our communities of unvaccinated people like a wildfire. If we would have had our community vaccinated, we would not be seeing this. And if you look around the country now, communities were able to get their vaccine right up into 75, 80%. They're not seeing this Delta wildfire spread. So that comment by the person who commented that the vaccine is helping prevent the spread. Another question that was asked, um, does garlic help your immunity? So at this point, there's been no scientific studies that anything like zinc, vitamin C, garlic, I'd encourage anybody, if you're comfortable taking supplements, take them, but they're not going to protect you against this virus. Another question was asked, will there be no, boost? Go ahead, David. Very specific to that. People need to realize you can do everything you want to to boost your immunity and with that. You have a problem. You're, it's not that you don't have a good immune system, it's that you have a naive immune system. Your immune system has never seen this. If you think to your history, Native Americans, they ate, they ate no processed foods, they were out walking around, they exercised, they did all the things that we talk about, to, you know, that people do naturally to improve their immune system. Europeans came here and the disease wiped them out because the Native Americans did not have immunity to the disease. They were naive. So basically, yes, you can take the supplements. You can do many things. You can exercise 
to improve your immune system. But if your immune system is naive, you have no protection. Another, thank you, David. Another chat is the vaccine has been around less than a year. How can the NCH feel so confident to give it and it's safe? As Dr. Poland explained, this vaccine has been studied, scrutinized more than any other vaccine in the history of mankind. So it is safe. FDA approval is coming. And as Dr. Poland stated, to have a vaccine approved the FDA is a Herculean effort. And from word on the street is it will be approved next month. One, one other thing to add to that, Doug, because there, there are a lot of misperceptions about this. Vaccine side effects occur within minutes to at most six weeks after getting a vaccine. That's the longest ever documented. This notion that a vaccine side effect would occur months or years later is um, speculation that has never been seen with a vaccine. It immunologically uh, is so improbable, even though people have looked for it, that a case has never been found. Um, thank you. A um, couple other questions was, uh, can the vaccine affect a mammogram? The answer is no. Uh, the vaccine will not affect your mammogram results or vice versa. And I would encourage you, Dr. Muscati held a town hall about uh, women's health in the vaccine that will be linked to our website. I would have you look at. Another question was, will we need boosters? The answer is yes, as Dr. Poland said, it's probably gonna be about eight months after. And the majority of people on this call are probably still within their first six months. So we have time. Another person asked about, can you please distinguish an N95 from a level one, level three mask? Um, the N95 masks helps prevent you from giving it or receiving the virus. A level three mask, a level two mask helps you prevent from spreading it, but also helps you prevent it from getting it by droplet. So the masks work, the masks help. In the ICU, we wear N95 masks because we are in infected patients' rooms. We're doing exams, we're close contact with the patients. So the level of mask depends on where you are working and the level of protection to you and the patient. Um, another question was, I think that's about all the <clears throat> comments. But again, I would encourage all of you on this call, and I appreciate everybody listening to this. You know, we're a family at NCH. I think David and I have talked about this a lot, that we are very, very concerned that one of our employees, one of our family members is going to get sick. And we have the potential to lose one of our employees due to this illness. And only thing we can truly do is to become vaccinated and continue to follow the masking, the social distancing, washing our hands. And for any of you that are still hesitant, I'd encourage you to just walk down to the intensive care unit. Go up to the ICU in North Naples. David's there this week. Go to the ICU at, North, at downtown and just have the charge nurse walk you through that ICU. It is emotionally disturbing to see the level of illness, the ages, the healthy people. I mean, we have never seen this level of illness in healthy individuals. So I encourage every one of you to truly think about the safety of the vaccine and be vaccinated. Okay, so um, again, to wrap this up, I wanted to thank all of you for talking to us while we've been rounding and, and listening. We, we want to lead with the science. Uh, we hope that you found this, this panel of physician experts helpful and for you to make your decisions to reinforce the decision you've already made or to be able to talk to a loved one that is on the fence. I want to stress that the, the goal that NCH has always had during this pandemic since day one is to provide the science and the evidence to help our community make healthy decisions easier. I think it's really important that NCH does not dictate public health policy. Our, our, our decisions, our, um, our policies are around our employee health and our patient health uh, focus. So the people that I, hear, I often hear in, in, media, in interviews with our media folk friends and from, uh, you know, people on the street, 
what do you think I should do? What do you think the county commissioner should do? What do you think the governor should do? We don't make comments. We don't make recommendations on public health policies. We are here to provide you with the science and the information so you can make a decision for you. So again, um, I hope you understand that this, the purpose of this was just to inform you all. Our physician experts were here to answer the questions that we saw uh, over the last three to four weeks. Um, and educate yourself, go out there for healthcare workers who are wondering about this vaccine requirement as a condition of employment. Go out there to beckers.com uh, and look at the number of healthcare systems that are also doing this as well. Not to dissuade you, but we wanna make sure you're informed and educated on any decision you make. There are over 1,500 hospitals and climbing daily that have required the vaccine as a condition of employment. Most hospitals in the, in the country, according to the American Hospital Association, require the vaccine as a condition of employment for a new employment already. So we wanna make sure that, again, you have an informed decision. And what's great about this country is that it is your right to do what you want. And I think we, we have a, our due diligence to tell you what we think is the right science behind all this very polarized topic. So, you know, John, the other, the other thing I would add is that, you know, as, as all of us being in the healthcare field, we have a duty to be amplifiers of scientific truth and information because so many people are being harmed by ignorance or misinformation, disinformation, misperceptions. So be an amplifier uh, and magnify, tell your circle of coworkers and friends and family about the importance of this. You only have to spend 15 minutes looking at the news stories uh, that are heartbreaking of families fractured by deaths and hospitalizations, much less long haul COVID symptoms, which will change your life. And one last thing, a uh, chat came across a lot of comments and said, thank you, excellent session, excellent session, very informative. Um, this will be posted on the NCH website. We'll have it linked in the Tuesday talk. I would encourage you to share it to people who couldn't make it on, share it with people out in the community. And we appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Be safe, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.